It was a crime that sent shockwaves through Beverly Hills. A wealthy movie mogul and his wife murdered in their million dollar mansion. The killers? Their very own sons. The case captivated the nation and it made Eric and Lyle Menendez household names. Then they went to prison and the story was over, right? Not so fast. The brothers are back. They've gained a new generation of followers on social media, and there's explosive new evidence that could potentially set them free. Join us for Menendez Mania, today on Death in Entertainment. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. And two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. <gasps> what do you call this thing anyway? Death in entertainment. Hello, Dead O World. Baby! Dipod Universe, look at us now. Look at us now. Like th- Things have uh, changed here for the better. Live and in color. This is what the studio has always looked like, but not what we've always looked like. Yeah, we did a little feng shui situation here, which we switched things around. We basically yeah. just cleaned a couple surfaces. Yes. And moved some furniture. <laughs> That's all it takes, <laughs> baby. Yeah. <laughs> and me and Kyle made a Mark sandwich here hey. in the studio. Yeah. Mark is now... In the middle. He's going skiing. It's I, I kind of like the looseness here. I can kind of like, yeah. I can punch you in the head, Kyle, and then, and then slap Alejandro <laughs> with my left hand. There we go. Yeah. What is going on, everybody? My name is Kyle Plouffe. My name is Mark Mulcairn. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. And would you believe it? We are on episode 83 talking today about the Menendez brothers and their... Uh, Shenanigans. <laughs> A- Eighty three. We could be. We could be running for president this year. That's right. <laughs> Is, was that Reagan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am not an invalid. Well. Yeah, that's that's Nixon, too. We're all over the map I'm going to kill my parents. <laughs> and if you haven't listened to this podcast before, if this is your first time, we're letting you know. We're a comedy, true crime podcast, so we, there's going to be some laughs along the way. Uh, you know, We're going to do our due diligence to make sure everybody is respected, but we do have fun here, okay? We have fun. It's going to get a little nasty, but we're going to have a lot of facts we're going to throw at you that's going to change your life. Yes. It's yeah. true crime with jokes. Hey, get used to it. Yeah. And also, get in the car, because we're going to August 20th, 1989. Oh, I'm in bitch. (laughs) (laughs) I like someone that calls bitch. (laughs) (laughs) August 20th, 1989. In the pop culture world, what is going on? Kyle, what was on TV I will, the evening of Sunday, August 20th? This is actually crazy. Uh, on TV, it's the Battle of the Sunday Night Movies. On NBC, Irreconcilable Differences, which was Drew Barrymore, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it, that was a theatrical movie, and this is when it would go to video, and then the networks would also get the rights to play them, mm-hmm. and it would be a big event. Yeah. Uh, on CBS, we had Nick Knight. Do you Not know Nick I, at night. No. That is the worst title. Also, just confusing <laughs> it with something that already exists in television. Yeah, this is odd. With yeah. a K. Night with a K. Yeah. Yes. And it, I have was a Was it like Night Rider or like, something? Like White Knight. You're yeah. close. Nick. It was actually about the character of Nick Knight, a failed pilot, actually. Oh. In the days, like Twin Peaks, they did that with, where they made a pilot movie, and what? then it went to series. Oh, wow. And so this was supposed to go to series. It starred Rick Springfield, and then it didn't. But then they revived it years later with Forever Night. Uh, okay. So there you go. <laughs> Did not let this night go away. I did not expect Alejandro to have the whole lineage of the story of, <laughs> Nick, of Knight. Nick Knight, <laughs> the trilogy. <laughs> it's a failed pilot TV movie. Okay, let's yeah. go on. On ABC, and most importantly, this is a crazy detail that will come up later in this podcast, The Spy Who Loved Me. Why will it be crazy, I wonder? I wonder. 
Yeah. <laughs> we shall say no more. Is that where they got the spy who shagged me from Austin Powers? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it must have been. They stole it from yeah. me. Nothing gets past Mark. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> <laughs> the buck stops right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's get into uh, some of the movies here, guys. Let's do it. Um, at the movies, AMC Century 14 in Los Angeles. Um, I don't know where this... Where is this theater? Century City. It's only like six miles away. Oh, okay. Is yeah. it still an AMC? I thought it was brand new. I had no idea. This is another thing that's going to come up uh, in the podcast as I'm well. I'm sure it's uh, it's definitely a uh, a place that where some of this stuff goes down. Hey. And yeah. I would like to preface this, Mark, by saying that the actual number one movie this weekend was Uncle Buck, which was new. Yeah. But it was not playing at the Century 14. They messed up. So please let us know what was playing. Well, I'll let you know right now. Um, Batman and THX. Um, Ooh. Great movie. <laughs> when they tried to sell it on THX Sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would always think my head was going to explode. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a guy's t-shirt the other day. It said, uh, when I come, it makes the THX sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I thought was funny. Sex, Lives, and Videotape. Great Steven Soderbergh. Oh movie okay. yeah wow. his, his first film wow yeah with uh james spader's in that and, made a big uh, splash uh yes it did laura san giacomo yes before just shoot me yeah ah. um who else uh, who's the guy with the eyebrows peter gallagher's in that Remember? eyebrows yeah he's the guy from the oc with the eyebrows eyebrows pete he was in that and um so wasn't what's her name because her daughter's big now uh the third is famous or fat Oh, no. oh Jesus! Andy McDowell. Andy McDowell. His her daughter is like a big actress now. She was in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So yes. another little factoid for you. Look into okay. that. Okay, Eddie At, and Nick Knight. Don't forget about yeah. that. Yeah, we got we a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of factoids here. Eddie and the Cruisers. Um, two. two. Eddie lives. <laughs> yeah. In case you thought Eddie died, he did yeah. not die. He is back. A lot of weird trilogies or <laughs> stories with random people we should know about, but we don't. Yep. Um, License to Kill. Another, yep. A Bond movie. Um, Do the Right Thing. Great Spike Lee movie. Um, Lock Up. Turner and Hooch. Love classic. Turner and Hooch. Classic <laughs> movie. Yeah. I like the. I came for the Hooch. I stayed for the Turner. Um, <laughs> Field of Dreams. Another classic. Wow. These are all just bangers. A lot of classics this weekend. <laughs> 1989 had bangers. Um, yeah, they did. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. The last good Indiana Jones I would say they made. Yeah. Another hot take from Mark here. <laughs> no, Am I, I like, saying just obvious things to you? I like the one with the aliens and Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's one coming out like next week. Oh, the one played at Con. I heard it was like the worst piece of shit ever. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So we're not going to, you know, there goes the Tom Hanks fans. Yep. Um, <laughs> Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I yeah. said, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is another classic, I think. Yeah. What a great weekend for the movies. As you said, a lot of bangers. Yes. yes. And there's going to be a couple more bangers. Hey. It's going to be some mash. On this <laughs> evening. <laughs> <laughs> This first chapter is called Nightmare on Elm Drive. Oh, I thought you were going to say street because you're a big Freddy Krueger I would have, but I was looking at the notes. Uh. <laughs> this is always the big argument between you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Sunday, August 20th, 1989. We're going right there. Let's do it. We know what's on TV. Yep. And we know what's playing in theaters. Especially in Century City. Yes. Eric and Lyle Menendez... 18 and 21, spent the day swimming and playing tennis behind their family's mansion in Beverly Hills, of course. Mm. Mm. They called their friend and former tennis coach Perry Berman to see if he wanted to go to the movies later. But Perry was not home. And when he returned the call, their dad, Eric and Lyle's dad, Jose, told Perry that the boys were out shopping at the Beverly Center. Lyle finally touched base with him around 5 p.m. Perry already had plans to attend the Taste of L.A. Food Festival in Santa Monica. Mm. So Lyle told him he'd meet him there after the movie. They were going to go see a movie. So the boys ate dinner with their parents, Jose and their mom, Kitty, as they usually did. 
Then they drove to the AMC Multiplex in Century City. Oh. Jose and Kitty decided to stay in that evening. It was the housekeeper's night off, after all, and they were enjoying a nice, relaxing summer evening at home. They settled into their comfy sofa to watch The Spy Who Loved Me in the TV room, which is in the back of the house. A large bookcase framed the room, showcasing a library of books and dozens of first-place tennis trophies. Because Lyle and Eric, they were kind of a big deal in the tennis world. Ah. Hmm. It piqued Kyle's interest a little there. <laughs> no, a little bit. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> Jose, Kyle, you're going to love these details. Jose was in tight shorts and a sweatshirt. Say less. Kitty wore jogging pants and sneakers. Wait a second. They had dishes <laughs> of strawberries and ice cream on the table in front of them. With his feet up on the table, Jose started to doze off. The alarm system was turned off that night because the kids were always setting it off by accident. By accident. <laughs> like, help! <laughs> <laughs> One neighbor heard firecrackers around 10 p.m., but thought nothing of it. And I have a quick clip here of a uh, witness to that. It sounded like... <laughs> That doesn't sound like firecrackers. It sounds like gunshots. He's doing this. Yeah. That, that's a kid who lives in Beverly Hills. These fireworks yeah. were going yeah. fucking crazy. I yeah. tell you what. Yeah. It was shooting metal bullets out of it. So, yeah, why is there some kid from Brooklyn in Beverly Hills? Yeah, a kid from Newsies was, happened to be walking yeah, by. Yeah, this is what I saw, huh? I was just selling the papes and boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Next thing you know, wango, bango, bullets are coming from nowhere. Over Broadway, I say. <laughs> so their friend Perry, remember him? Scary Perry. He left, not as scary as the brothers. Yeah. He left the Taste of L.A. at 10.20 p.m. and then went to bed. He received a call from Lyle 15 minutes later asking him why he wasn't at the festival. Mm. Perry told him they'd waited a while and then assumed that the brothers weren't coming. Lyle told him they got lost. Sorry. He then insisted that they still meet up because he had questions about his tennis game and wasn't sure there'd be time to meet up before he returned to Princeton that fall. Hmm. He's an Ivy Leaguer. As Not only say. a great tennis player, but an Ivy Leaguer. Yeah. Oh. Perry reluctantly agreed, and they made plans to meet up at the Cheesecake Factory before Kyle called back yet again to say that they better meet at the mansion because Eric needed to pick up his fake ID. Ah. He wanted to join them for drinks, and yeah. he's only 18, remember. Perry put his foot down and said he would not make the extra pit stop and that he'd meet them at the restaurant directly. Yeah, with LA traffic, you know, you don't want to be driving all over the place for some other person that screwed up. I told you I would meet you at the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is like the it's early a... days of the Cheesecake Factory, too. Yeah, when their menu was just uh, the size of a phone book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they whittled it down to yeah. half that now. <laughs> it used to be three cheese uh, pasta, now yeah. it's four cheese. Well, the brothers never made it there. Why? What happened? Around 11.30 p.m., the boys returned home to find their parents brutally gunned down. And they must have been shocked because they didn't know <laughs> that happened. It's a shocking thing to walk in on. Of course, especially if you had nothing to do with it. Yeah, especially. It was a gruesome sight. Their parents didn't resemble humans anymore. Oof. Oh, God. They were that ripped apart by bullets. Wow. Did they see their parents as humans even before that, though? We'll get into that. Okay. There was blood splatter throughout the entire room. And then Lyle took control and dialed 911. And let's hear that call. I just want another clip of that kid that's like, hey, I was outside the house. All I heard was, it was gunfire <laughs> crazy. <laughs> like a nuclear bomb, but like, uh, yeah, but, but like, like firecrackers. Fi fireworks. Yeah, but fireworks. <laughs> but on 4th of July. <laughs> Turns out he wasn't even in town that night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says a lot of stories. I'm sorry, kill my parents. Pardon me? <laughs> what? Who? Are they still there? Yes. The people. Who... No, no, no. Are they still there? Yes. No. Why is this 911 lady? She's so shocked. Like, wait, what? 
Yeah, isn't that her job? Yeah. <laughs> Lady, I'm calling 911. Yeah, wait a second. Someone killed your parents? She's like, this is the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> you dialed the wrong number. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Yeah, those are crocodile tears. I'm not buying that. Oof. Yeah, so he said, someone killed my parents. Oh, boy. Uncanny, my impression. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that tape was played so often around the time of this whole thing going on. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get ahead of anything, but yeah. though that, that, you know, bullshit, you know, tears was just like everyone heard it and knew it was nonsense. Not right away, though. Really? Another yeah. neighbor said they saw one of the brothers curled up on the front lawn, hysterically crying. Everything pointed to a mafia hit. That first night. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> because the brothers implied it was. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, the dad was like an executive, and so you never knew if he got tied up into any shady business deals or something. It could, yeah, could have happened. You know. Yeah. Was it the yeah, executive of like the Olive Oil Corporation yeah. or something? We're gonna get into that too. Don't worry. Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> yeah. This is a little. He brought in the three cheese uh, pasta. <laughs> yeah. This is all a little prelude. Yeah. Okay. It was just a factory before he got there. Oh, yeah. He brought the cheesecake. <laughs> then it was on. You see that cheesecake? Yeah. I, I did that. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean Parker came around and was like, you should lose the and factory. Yeah. Just yeah. call it cheesecake. You yeah. know what's cool? A billion cheesecakes. <laughs> and they're like, no, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, he's like, all right, I'll get, I'm out of here. <laughs> so... Eric went as far as to point the finger at a guy named Noel Bloom, a distributor of pornographic films and a former associate of the Bonanno organized crime family. Wow. Wow. How the, how did he make that connection? Because <laughs> he had met Jose once before. So a porn, more, a porn mafia guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right. Usually mob hits were done with a single bullet to the back of the head and never included the wife. Yeah. So there's yes. some holes in this, what would you call it? Um, story. The story. story. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> What's that word I'm looking for? Yeah, that word. So you're saying uh, porn mafia guys have some principles. <laughs> they don't kill the wife. Well, yeah, never the kids, never the wife. Yeah. Yeah, that's why like sometimes when you know people were... In the Irish mob wars, they would leave a note to their wife and kid being like, hey, I got to take off for a while. I'll keep you guys safe. Yeah. And they just wouldn't touch the house. And give them yeah. money sometimes, the surviving members. Yeah. yeah. Like, but, sorry we had to whack Louie, but yeah. here's a couple of shackles. People, people used to have freaking values. Yeah. <laughs> what happened these days? Like when men were men. Yeah. You got Menendez getting, you know, whacked with their wives. Shoving firecrackers up their parents' ass. Yeah, Cheesecake Factory uh, <laughs> leftovers all over the fucking chest. <laughs> <laughs> and now spaghetti is just macaroni noodles with ketchup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like a schnook. Where's the gravy? <laughs> <Yeah>. My own. <laughs> For these murders, there were 14 12-gauge shotgun blasts, five to the head and body of Jose. <laughs> 14? <laughs> and Kitty was hit with nine. Nine times. Oof. Yeah. That it's- was a Roman candle. <laughs> oh. They lit her up like July 4th. <laughs> Nine times, like Ferris Bueller, remember? Like Jeffrey yeah. Jones. Jeffrey Jones. <laughs> so the first round of shots apparently struck Kitty in her chest, right arm, left hip, and left leg. So all over. That's a lot of Jeez. shots to, like... Especially with a shotgun. I'm sure she's a smaller lady, too. Like, you know, that <laughs> that's way... That's overkill. Literally overkill. Yeah. She was once a beauty queen. Oof. Really? Yeah, not so beautiful that night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's not a, was the uh, beauty queen dancing scene or something? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, <okay>. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the shell casings were removed from the scene, and murder-suicide was quickly ruled out after the cops conducted residue tests on the bodies. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, there's no... Uh... Residue on his on a non-existent hands. Like, yeah, everything's just destroyed. It's just blue liquid Mar- yeah, just, yeah, he liquefied <laughs> the bodies. Yeah, they're picking him up with a thermos. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta take this guy down the lab. Yeah, I'd go with the uh, the closed coffin. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah, they're sweeping up the limbs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the Menendez brothers appeared very distraught. So out of compassion, 
Detectives decided to skip the routine chemical tests that would have determined if either of them fired a gun that night. Because when you fire a gun, like some residue just, you know, there's no way of not knowing that you fired a gun. It, they test your right arm, don't they? They test, yeah, they test both your hands and your arms to see if there's any gunpowder that came back onto you. Yeah, the, yeah. the kickback gunpowder. Neighbors watched in disbelief as ambulances loaded up the bodies from the crime scene. Man. Beverly Hills averages two murders per year. Not usually in the same night. They just hit the quota. Yes, yeah. they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those neighbors must have been going wild. Yeah. Within days, detectives hit a dead end investigating that mafia theory. Yeah. And their sights were now set on Eric and Lyle. The only difficulty was there was no evidence linking them to the crime. Hmm. But did mm. they get the test of to see if they fired gunshots? The kids? Well, no. After a while, after a couple of days, it's like it's too late. Yeah. So they uh, fumbled that right, right off the bat. Yep. Yeah. They couldn't think that these good, wholesome boys that have fake IDs uh, could have done anything like this. Not in Beverly Hills. I, a different time, I guess. Another zip code, maybe. Yeah. Well, I think in L.A., you know, they, especially around the Rodney King times, you know, people, the LAPD weren't the greatest group of people in the world. Not to say they've gotten much better, but, yeah, you know, they probably thought it was uh, an outside influence that came and killed them. Yeah, they made the shit list once or twice. Uh, a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to backtrack a little. And this chapter is called Meet the Menendezes. Wow. <laughs> there they are. Looks like a happy, uh, nice family who, uh, who's doing great. Jose was a Cuban emigre born in an upper middle class family in Havana, Cuba in the 1940s. Ooh, Havana. And he was a top rated swimmer sent to the U.S. at age 16 to escape Castro's regime mm. and landed in Pennsylvania. And then while studying at Southern Illinois University at age 19... He met a dame named Mary Anderson, nicknamed Kitty. Kitty. Mary Anderson. Mr. I, Anderson. <laughs> no offense to anyone out there, but I always found Kitty to be an annoying nickname. I remember Kitty Dukakis. Remember uh, Michael Dukakis, his yeah. wife? She She's the one that drank like all the bleach because like, she was like... She, she was, yeah, it's, it's always some lady that drinks bleach. Yeah, yeah I don't know why. I'm sorry, Kyle. It's, it's a true story. Yeah. She did. She had some troubles, but she survived and she's doing a lot better now. Oh, wow. She lives in she's Brooklyn. Still alive? She's fine. Uh, yeah. Wow. She's still married to Michael Dukakis and he ran for president and didn't work out. He's the guy that... Got on the tank, and he looked like a fool, and he lost to George Bush. <laughs> Wouldn't be a prudent. Uh, so, yeah, Kitty is a interesting name. For some reason, I thought both of the Menendez parents were Cuban. I didn't know Kitty no, was not Cuban. Not at all. Interesting. Mm. A blonde former beauty queen. Yeah. Bombshell. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's subjective. Yeah. yeah. But, yes, yeah, she was a pretty lady. Yeah. <laughs> How did how did they make it out to Los Angeles? They, so they're like he starts in Pennsylvania, moves to Southern Illinois University. Yeah, this guy's all over the map. Yeah, we're moving along now. We'll get we'll end in Los Angeles. Okay. Right. So he ended up earning a degree in accounting from Queens College in Flushing. Wow, this guy! What the hell? They soon welcomed two babies, Joseph Lyle Menendez. Born on January 10th, 1968, and Eric Galen Menendez, born on November 27th, 1971. I never knew Lyle's name was his middle name. Mm -hmm. He's got Joseph, Joey. Hey, Joey, what's up, bro? Joey Menendez. Of no, the... call me Lyle. Yeah, Lyle. <laughs> Any... Lyle, Lyle, Crocodile. Yep. Any Crocodile name tears. that ends in Isle with a Y. Uh, it's, it's, tell yeah, me about it's it, brother. It's a nightmare. Tell me about it. The family settled in <laughs> Hopewell Township, New Jersey. Jersey. Now this makes it the mafia element kind of makes mm -hmm. sense now. And Jose had a rapid career rise, a classic American success story. He was an executive at Hertz. Hertz, the rental car place. Yeah, Hertz, well, you, you, don't well, it. You, you motioned to me like, uh, like what am I, Johnny Hertz over here? <laughs> <laughs> and then... The record division at RCA, hey. where he signed the Eurythmics, Duran Duran. What? 
and Menudo in a thirty million dollar deal. Wow, I your couldn't... boys from Menudo. Yeah, Menudo. I couldn't picture him listening to Eurythmics this yeah. guy. And like, I, that, this is the next band. Yep. Dave Stewart said that. He was very odd, Jose Menendez. Really? Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics. Yeah, who was yeah. like the brainchild behind Eurythmics with Annie Lennox? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And when Stewart presented his new album to Jose, Jose told him, Oh, I love it. It's just like the Ghostbusters. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the comparison between the movie Ghostbusters and the Euryth- Eurythmics. I can't even say that word. <laughs> Eurythmics. <laughs> Eurythmics. <laughs> And what's your influences? Uh, the movie Ghostbusters <laughs> and Eurythmics. And Eurythmics, <laughs> yeah, I like it already. That's great influences, Dev. With Menudo, Jose took an obsessive personal interest in the group. Ooh, I bet he did. And that may come up <laughs> later again. Mm, really? Him and Dave Stewart were in flagrante? No, Menudo. Oh, Menudo. Okay. <laughs> Mark can't get off of the year with Mark. Start fake blind items. <laughs> <laughs> Eric and Lyle went to an exclusive Princeton day school and trained to become, as I mentioned, highly ranked tennis and soccer players. Later, throwing soccer aside and focusing on tennis. Tennis is t- you got to start young with tennis mm-hmm. if you w- really want to be, you know, a good prospect. It's yeah. it's a very tough thing to get into. There's a lot of like elite people that that put their kids into tennis. Yeah, the elite of the elite. That's it what pretty the much is. Yeah, Menendez family is. Yeah. In 1986, Jose was passed over for a promotion at RCA. So he left the company and uprooted the family to... Los Angeles. He quickly established himself at International Video Entertainment, later known as Live Entertainment. Whoa. A video distributor that was a division of Coralco Pictures. Coralco, of course, responsible for Rambo and Terminator. Which I'm named after. Right. Kyle. Oh, really? Yeah. Kyle Reese. Kyle Reese. Kyle Kyle Crocodile. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) As an executive there, Jose oversaw big profits. The year before his arrival, the company lost $20 million. Then it earned $8 million in 1987 and $16 million in 1988. Jose was a shrewd businessman. Yeah. Some said... He was well-liked. Most said he was despised, and that he made a lot of enemies along the way. He would say things like, what are we paying you for, to the underlings? He sounds like a typical just asshole boss, you know. Nothing too spectacular, just a prick hack. Yeah, hack. Because of a hack. (laughs) Well, his favorite music is Ghostbusters, so (laughs) what do you expect? Colleague (laughs) Roger Smith called him a control freak and that he went above and beyond anybody he'd ever dealt with in the industry. So Jose had few personal friends. He was not proud of his heritage either, but he also knew how to use it to his advantage. He had a desire to run for U.S. Senate from Florida one day in order to free Cuba. Wow. So he had designs that he was going to be huge. He had ambitions. Yeah, he's going to keep ascending. Wow. Kitty was a deeply unhappy woman, an alcoholic and also into pills. She was suicidal throughout her adult life. There are three attempts on her life that we know of. Damn. She was severely distressed over Jose's alleged infidelity. Apparently, he had a woman he was seeing in New York City on the side. Man. So he's, like, very detached. Um, Also, he's just, like, out of town a lot. Yeah, on business. Yeah. And whatever. And, uh, you know, she's just stuck there alone with those two kids, and she probably doesn't have a lot of Beverly Hills friends. Like, she's, she's probably not... The real housewives aren't kicking around Beverly Hills yet, so she doesn't really have like yeah. some crew to, to run the town with. Yeah, it's like anybody who marries someone that's you know rich, self-made, and sociopathically ambitious, it's yeah. like you're gonna get cheated on. Just yeah, that, that's it is what it is. And I wonder about <laughs> some of those CEOs and presidents of companies. Oh, 100 percent. You have to be a bit of a sociopath to get there in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's nothing more scary than that generation, like that that hard worker that feels they really need to prove themselves. Yeah. It's like astronomical 
uh, the amount of psychopaths and sociopaths in like the C-suite jobs, like the the Fortune five hundred, yeah, 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 CFOs, COOs, all those, because it's only like you know a few per- percent of the actual population, but it's like. Fifty <laughs> percent, yeah, of like CEOs of like shit. high performers and stuff, yeah, and, that, and that's why shareholders want to hire them because they're like pit bull maniacs, yeah. and they'll mm-hmm. go in there and like be like this guy <laughs> Jose and just kind of you know run roughshod over the entire uh, company until it's running right. Yeah, mm. and on the flip side, Kitty had aspirations to be an actress, which ended when the kids were born, yeah. and Jose ordered her to be a stay-at-home mom. Damn. And she would call him at the office every 30 minutes. Nah. Sometimes just asking him, what do you want on your pizza tonight? Wow. So she just... On on her for her choice, she was micro micromanaged by her husband. Yeah, so she's the one making the phone calls and stuff. She also could have been doing that to fuck with him to make him finally be like, "All right, go out, do your own fucking thing." Yeah, like, maybe. Yeah, just that's what I'd do. Oversaturating him with like questions, like, yeah. "Should I um should I pick up this vase and put it back down?" Like, yeah. what? <laughs> you tell me, dickhead. Yeah, this is what you want. Should I dust? <laughs> the parents spoiled Lyle and Eric, but also controlled them. Get this. They did their homework for them. Wow. So then when the kids went to school and took tests, they would fail. Uh, Yeah. See, I like the someone doing homework for me idea, but then (laughs) then it kind of like washes out with the test. It just wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And they were very much pushed into tennis. Wasn't their choice. Yeah. Although they became very good at it, so it did turn into something they enjoyed. Yeah. So they got beaten into submission into enjoying tennis, basically. Mm -hmm. And they had to be the best. Yeah. You can't just show up. Yeah, Yeah. Jose wouldn't be proud. Yeah. They hid Eric's dyslexia from all his teachers. And one teacher said, why didn't you tell us about this? Because we could have helped him. Yeah. So they weren't able to really progress mentally. Yeah. Well, there's a fear you'll get put in like a special class or Mm -hmm. something. Yeah, some people just want to hide what they consider to be like a defect or something wrong. Yeah. Because it'll dampen their image or like make them not look as pristine as they are. For sure. And he was happening to It's all a veneer yeah. of bullshit. Yeah. And he was held back and they lied about that. Her ah. friend said, Oh, isn't Eric in such and such grade this year? And she was like, No. No, he's always been in fourth grade. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh That's what she said. God. But he's nineteen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has a mustache. <laughs> yeah. It's like Billy Madison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, back to school. <laughs> and if they were around now, the Menendez family. They for sure would have been embroiled in that varsity blues scandal. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Yeah, that would have been patient zero of that <laughs> show. Yeah. That would build a whole new cell for them. Yeah. So the family lived in Calabasas. So they moved to Calabasas, or this is their first location was Calabasas? First location was Calabasas gotcha. when they went to California. Yeah. Kardashian country. Of course. I love Calabasas. They were in the middle of building their dream home. 13 acres with beautiful mountain views. Oof. But then they suddenly fled to Beverly Hills. Why? Well, I'll tell you. Let's hear it. I'm talking to myself I'm on the edge of my seat here. (laughs) The brothers got into some criminal activity in summer 1988. Hot prowls, they're called. Burglary and grand theft at two homes, totaling more than $100,000 in money and jewels. Ooh. Damn. That, and that, well, for inflation, that'd be like $30 million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jose stepped in and fixed the situation as he usually did by putting a Band-Aid on it. Most of the stolen goods were returned, and he wrote a check to make up the difference. Eric took the fall for both brothers because he was underage and Lyle was a Princeton guy. Uh, So he couldn't tarnish his name. Wow. Eric got probation and was ordered to undergo counseling. Kitty's psychologist recommended a man named Dr. Jerome Ozeal in Beverly Hills. Sounds like trouble. And there's an incident where Kitty OD'd on Xanax and alcohol around this time, and she was admitted to Westlake Hospital. This is like a household in in peril. In late 1988, Jose bought a house at 722 Elm Drive in Beverly Hills to get away from Calabasas. 
<laughs> the hell of Calabasas. Yeah. <laughs> and he Usually bl- people move out to like the for the the more rural suburbs. Yeah. yeah. He blamed Calabasas that there was a bad crowd there. <laughs> so the new place is 9,000 square feet, eight bedroom, Mediterranean style, red tile roof, courtyard, swimming pool, tennis court, and a guest house. Nice. Previous tenants included Elton John and Prince. Man. Actress Robin Greer, who I've never heard of, says she once hosted a baby shower for Nicole Brown Simpson there. Wow. The Menendezes refused to buy it furnished because Jose had too much pride. So Who I, buys a house furnished though? I don't know. I don't know if I if I would uh, like that. The problem is they were new money, so they had no taste. So they oh. ended up filling this beautiful home with tacky furniture. They went to like Ikea? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Robin Greer is uh, majorly known from Falcon Crest, mm. a, a 1986-87 TV series. She's on 23 episodes. Other than that, she was on uh, Freddy's Nightmares for one episode, Quantum Leap, They Came From Outer Space, Dear John, and Roseanne as customer number one. Oh, do you remember the Jackie <laughs> Thomas show? That was actually Tom Arnold's show. Oh, really? He got his own show called the Jackie Thomas show. I don't know why they called it that. But In 93, she played Bimbo. Oh, nice. That's her last credit. That <laughs> coveted role of Bimbo. Hot career there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice work if you can get it. <laughs> the Menendez family would live at the house less than one year. Wow. Ooh. Because uh, they just upgraded and they were still happy and they <laughs> yeah. moved, moved on. They Eric had their mail forwarded. <laughs> Everything's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eric transferred to Beverly Hills High, and Lyle was enrolled at Princeton University, where his dad had donated fifty thousand dollars to get him in. Man, yeah, he, this is varsity to get him blues. in. To get him in. Yeah. Wow. Well, people do that today. You know, they, it's just done through various ways. You know, they funnel it yeah. through like nonprofits and like all this nonsense. Like, hey, uh, sorry, my son's kind of not what you take here, but uh, you take 50K, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he can't read or write. <laughs> he shoots a hell of a shotgun, though. Johnny oh. Baloney's going to, he's going uh, mean, to drop off racket. a bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eric had, did you say Johnny Baloney? I said, uh, my friend Johnny Baloney is going to drop off a bag. In it is, is yours. Whatever is in it is yours. Is yours. It's some cash and a finger. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And some baloney. It's all the people's fucking <laughs> jewels from Calabasas. Yeah. <laughs> Eric had made friends with a kid named Craig Signorelli. Signorelli, Signorelli. <laughs> the son. <laughs> Let me see your belly. Yeah. The son of a TV executive. <laughs> He was the captain of the <laughs> Calabasas tennis team, where Eric was the number one singles player. They once got into a fight with rival students that escalated quickly and resulted with Eric's broken jaw. That makes sense. Damn. This bonded them together. They gave each other nicknames, King and Shepherd, feeling that they were something special. So they used to sit at the overlook, overlooking the city and just dream about being big shot someday. We're going we're yeah. to run this city. It's like an like entourage or something. Yeah. It's so funny when like rich kids fight. It's either one of two things. Either they're actually really tough, like very annoyingly, because you want them to be a pussy, or they always get their jaw broken like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. no in between. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I saw Spencer Pratt on the hills. Yeah. He was going to fight some guy. Oh, He's and, got a punchable face. Yeah, yeah, he just goes, welcome to L.A., bro. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just. Like the mean streets, even though he's like some from Rich House or something. Yeah. <laughs> mean streets of Laguna Beach. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to LA, bro. Yeah. The mean sands. <laughs> yeah. Of Laguna Beach. According to Signorelli, Eric was ostentatious and flamboyant. Eric would enter a store, and if the clerk didn't help him right away, he'd stand up on the table and say, Hey, I'm here to buy something. Wow, so he's like the ultimate rich kid prick. I mean, Signorelli is definitely a rich kid, too, because if uh, anybody I know called someone ostentatious and flamboyant, it it would just be, he was gay. (laughs) (laughs) There were a lot of rumors that Eric was gay. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Not that verbose. Ostentatious? No, he was gay. Is him, him and this Signorelli kid, are they uh, eating one big uh, piece of spaghetti together? 
One big baloney, <laughs> it sounds like. Johnny baloney. <laughs> Johnny gave him his own baloney. <laughs> <laughs> so they co-wrote a screenplay together titled Friends. Not to be, <laughs> Wait, <laughs> not to be confused. Kyle with, just spit out his drink. <laughs> not to be confused with the hit sitcom yeah. that would come years later. Yeah, no, it's just, it was a stream play that's like just two guys sitting around being like, hey, we're just friends, okay? <laughs> yeah. We're totally not ostentatious but and flamboyant together. They're, they're two <laughs> Joey Tribbiani's just saying that we're just friends. <laughs> we're just friends pal. Back it up, pal. Yeah, they're, they're going to every location telling people, hey, we're just friends. <laughs> Do you guys want a booth or we're just friends? We're just, did you not just hear me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it ain't gay if we just blow each other, <laughs> yeah. right? It ain't gay if we're just friends. <laughs> we want two straws, okay? <laughs> well, like what? I was thinking about hot chicks when I was blowing up. <laughs> the plot of this screenplay centers on a young man named Hamilton Cromwell who murders his rich parents for the inheritance. Ooh, and here's a little story. excerpt. Kyle, actually, do you want to read the excerpt? Yes. The door opens, exposing the little. Oh, fuck. <laughs> It's like Fifty Shades of Grey. Here. Yes. Fifty Interior Shades of Gay. Interior Cheesecake Factory. Yeah. <laughs> the door opens, exposing the luxurious sight of Mr. and Mrs. Cromwell lying in bed. Their faces are of questioning horror as Hamilton closes the door behind them, gently saying, Good evening, mother. Good evening, father. All light is extinguished. And the camera slides, uh, now it's being read by Alec Baldwin. <laughs> All light is extinguished, and the camera slides down the stairs as screams are heard from behind. This is just the actual set of rust. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if he didn't try to hide it at all and it said, interior, Menendez living room. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the kicker. He crossed out his dad's name. Yeah. <laughs> Kitty typed out the screenplay for Lyle. Wow. She's typing out her own fucking death scenario. Mm -hmm. I like I like that Ki Kitty has final draft, too. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably wow. like, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Yeah. <laughs> Can you type this out for me? <laughs> oh, my God. Eric gave a copy of the script to his photographer friend, Philip Kearney, to read. Kearney. They had become friends after he shot sexy photos of Eric. Ooh. Let's see this. All there right, let's are. take a look at these. Whoa. Shirtless. Wow. Look at this guy. Semi shirtless. The a shirt's like hanging off his every shoulder. Is that even a shirt? <laughs> it just looks like a piece of cloth. Yeah, it could be a piece of cloth. Yeah. He's a piece of meat. Jizz yeah. rag, who knows? Okay. <laughs> Whoa. Jeez, we're getting the unvarnished Kyle today. <laughs> so as you can see, Eric showed interest in becoming an actor or model. He saw himself as something bigger than he was or, or should well, have been. He's like any L.A. kid. Sure. Fluffer, twink, any of the <laughs> <Yeah>. above. <laughs> he wanted to be in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle's unleashed today. Yeah. And I've heard that he gave a rousing performance of a Hamlet soliloquy in class. Ooh. So he was an actor in, co in high school, mm -hmm. in college, yeah. High school. Okay. Before the trouble that summer of 88, Lyle actually embarrassed his father the fall previously. You have embarrassed your father twice. <laughs> he was suspended from Princeton after one semester no! after getting caught cheating in Psych 101. Oh, my God. Well, he God. doesn't... He's not a good student, you know? I, I'm sure it's really hard going to Princeton. Yeah, I'm sure this set him the fuck... Jose, mm -hmm. the fuck off, because he's like, psychology? Really? I'm a sociopath. I know everything about <laughs> yeah. psychology. Yeah. I fucking ruin people's minds. Mm -hmm. And you can't even fucking get through one 101 class? If I ask you for anything. Oof. Yeah, and he basically just gave him a big fat silver spoon. Yeah. <laughs> And Lyle just tossed it away. Yeah. Well, I think Lyle needs like he needs like an on campus like um a tutor. Tutor, yeah. He needs to, to learn how to read. Yeah. Someone to help him. Someone to like fall, you know, go to classes with him. That's why his name's Lyle, because he's dyslexic. He's using his middle name as his first name because he's switching them up. Yeah. Lyle Joseph. That's <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. If you start a kid off like that, you know, they're gonna go down the wrong dyslexic path. My name's Lyle. <laughs> it's Joseph Lyle. That's right. Not, it's not what it says on your license here. <laughs> it's wrong. 
So <laughs> clearly not Ivy League material. And uh, that's why he was hanging around and getting into trouble with Eric uh, later on. Okay. Lyle briefly worked at live entertainment with uh, his dad. How do you get that job? <laughs> <laughs> it rhymes with schleppetism. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, according to sources, he acted like a spoiled rich kid. This he, kid? He left Get early to go to his tennis lessons. Uh, he was allowed to return to Princeton after a one-year suspension. At this point, Jose was losing patience. Brother-in-law Carlos Baralt says that Jose was planning to revise his will and cut out his sons. Wow. Oh, man, both of them. Both of them. In school, Eric was a loner, always carrying around his tennis racket, I guess. <laughs> no books or anything? It was his ten- stick. <laughs> and his stick. Yeah. The contractor always carries around his tools. Yeah. But he had it in like a violin case or yeah. something? <laughs> no, he had it in the fucking toolbox. <laughs> yeah. It's tool time. And while Eric was shy, Lyle was a ladies' man. Some say even a playboy. Yeah. Jose didn't approve of a lot of the older women he was choosing to date, though. Older women? Yeah, he, Lyle was into older women. He's like, you're going to be banging one of my side pieces. Get out of my <laughs> yeah. fucking honey pot. Yeah. <laughs> and Jose he's even. Like, Let me show you how to swing that racket. He's, like, he's behind her. <laughs> <laughs> Jose even <laughs> intervened to buy one of his girlfriends an abortion when she became pregnant. Ooh. And he, he, he said, L- let me get this. Yeah. <laughs> and he sent one of them to Europe, paid wow. for her to go to Europe for some modeling excursion. Wow. Just, just to get her away from Lyle. Wow. In summer, Wait, the dad did this? Jose. Oh, oh my okay. God. And he was intervening in the kids' lives like this, controlling who they're He dating. was micromanaging his life, too, just like uh, yes. Kitty. Yeah. And Kitty, I don't even know if that's micromanaging. I saw it more as her just being bored as hell yeah. in the house. Who could be bored in L.A.? Maybe in the well, late 80s, who's... Beverly Hills it was boring. But Well, someone who's cooped up with her two sons, and one of them's like just not there, and the other one yeah. just like, she doesn't want to, ra- they have the means to have someone take care of the kids. Mm-hmm. She wanted to be an actress. Of yeah. course she's losing her mind. She has no purpose other than... Typing up her son's script, which is sounds like shit, but it's also <laughs> yeah. her actual murder being typed up. It's crazy. And actually, that she's excited about it because it's the first time she's read a script in a while. Yeah, exactly. And she wants to audition for the Jackie Thomas show. Oh. She wants to be on that, too. He's like, don't worry, you got the role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Arnold snorting coke. Yeah. I think you're perfect. <laughs> what is that, fireworks? Yeah. I used to fuck Roseanne, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad she couldn't get on that Nick Knight movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. With Rick Springfield. Yeah, they're right? throwing in those parts out to anyone. Jeez. In summer 1989, Lyle moved out to the guest house while Eric remained in the main house. <laughs> this next chapter is called Millionaire Orphans. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. After the murders. In the aftermath of the murders, the brothers bounced around between fancy hotels. They eventually rented two condos at the Marina City Club Towers. Their aunt, Marta Cano, flew in from Florida to be with them. She would stay at the Elm Drive house leading up to the trial, not to give anything away. Well, (laughs) this is crazy. The Marina City Club Towers, I thought were always um, like 50 plus or 60 plus. Everyone... from my actual work that I've done in here, it's always been for super old people. I just assumed that it was like an old thing. So what I could just imagine these two people? dopes just fucking hanging out with a bunch of friggin' 90-year-olds in their really? condo in Marina Del Rey. Yeah. Lyle was into older women. Ah, that's true! <laughs> He's like, Beatrice, you are looking very sexy today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love your blue curls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's like, I'm taking my uh, girlfriend out to dinner. It's like 4.30. <laughs> it's the early bird special. <laughs> I got to be back at my door at 7 p.m. Yeah, you Perry understand? Mason's on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be watching Nick Knight. Yeah. <laughs> I heard it's great. So I know you're wondering the Elm Drive property was not fully paid off. Oh. And it eventually sold to a mystery writer 
and you have a bit more of an update, right, Kyle? Uh, yes. Whoever owns it now is at. If it's not a uh, a company that does events, they rent it out for events. So uh, there was a client, events. There was a client of mine that had. Want to like, see where people Jose got and blown Kitty. apart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to see where fucking people got put in a blender? Do I got the event for you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally, they uh, the, this person I know was at the Menendez house um, for a, a party, a corporate party. We got to add that to the tour. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, the problem is when you're trying to resell that, like legally, a realtor has to tell you that there were murders in there like that. It depends. Some states, they have to openly disclose it. In some states, they only have to say it if you ask. But I mean, it's such a massive. Has there been any, been any yeah. weird murders in yeah. here? <laughs> and there's a, a lot weird of moment. Yeah. There's a lot of people that would probably want to live there more knowing that happened. Yeah. No, but... Sickos. Uh, but all, Yeah, sickos, yes. Maybe not people that are like, I don't want weirdos that are into murder driving by my house just to like investigate it. This ended up being a thing. Like us. With, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. The we whole, don't want the die pod tour. Yeah. Yeah. Up. We don't want any die heads going past there. The, with the whole disclosure thing, uh, in Michigan there was a woman who... Uh, bought a house and she was sitting in her house watching this serial killer documentary and realized that she was sitting in the house where the serial killer had murdered all these women in the basement mm. and was so pissed, went back, tried to take the real estate agent to court and the agent said, it's legal to not tell you because you never asked. And it was like, and he it goes, was up hell. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Enjoy all the go <laughs> Bye. Sorry, I'm counting all the money I made on your stupid ass. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good tip. Yeah. Always ask, was anybody murdered was here? Was anybody executed here? Yeah. <laughs> Live entertainment went into public relations mode after Jose died. They arranged a memorial service in an auditorium at the Directors Guild in Hollywood. The brothers spoke reverently about their parents with unusual calm and hmm. poise. Hmm. Another funeral was held in Princeton and then another one in Florida, which the brothers did not attend because they were kind of funeraled out at that point. <laughs> and then... You guys are bumming us out. Yeah. They went on a spending spree. Despite their worries to the contrary, Eric and Lyle were listed as the sole beneficiaries of the Menendez estate, estimated to be worth around $14 million. Wow. They each received around 250 k immediately from a life insurance policy. Besides that, they were running around with Jose's American Express Platinum card. The brothers were seen renting furniture at Antiquarium Traders. What? A hip furniture store. <laughs> hey, man, I know what I want to do with my money. I want to rent some furniture, dog. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's where... I want to rent a nice Arnois for a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> that could be the store where Ray Combs worked when he moved. Yeah, it could have been. Hey, you kids, where can I put, can I put you into this love seat for one weekend? Why are they renting furniture? Antiquarian traders. Yeah. They're going straight there. Yeah, yeah I know what I'm doing. Odd ducks. Can I sign this two hundred fifty thousand dollar check over to you, <laughs> yeah. Antiquarium? Lyle bought a Porsche 911 Carrera. Nah, that's what I'm talking about. While Eric opted for the less flashy Jeep Wrangler. Ooh. <laughs> designer clothes. Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> they also bought designer clothes and a Rolex watch. Couple of Rolexes. So they're going against the Goodfellas rule, which is to lay low, don't buy new shit. Yeah. <laughs> this is what gets people popped. They're buying the brand new Cadillac and the fur coat. Yeah. yeah. Take this fucking jacket off right now. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Put it back where you got it. I don't care where you got it. Put it back. And then you get an ice pick in your fucking brain cavity. Yeah, like Carbone. <laughs> Eric hired a personal tennis coach that costs 50 grand a year. Lyle bought a small restaurant. Really? He renamed Mr. Buffalo's in Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah. And he had told family members that it was something Kitty always wanted of him oh, yes. to own a business. Yeah, I want. she always wanted me to own a Mr. Buffalo's in Princeton, New Jersey. This is the... That's it. Yeah. That we have a it photo of. It used to be up. Spring Street Cafe. That looks like a dump. That looks like a sandwich shop. Yeah, it looks like a trailer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he hired his buddy Who, Who's to, this, the to, GM? To yeah. run it. Yeah, his buddy. Oh, Trey Parker here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they would fly coast to coast on MGM Grand Air. Oh, wow. Wow, they, I didn't know MGM Grand had a 
at an airline. They did till these fucking guys showed up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, there like a Paramount uh, Paramount Airlines also? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a Mickey Fun Bus <laughs> as well. Eric paid forty thousand dollars for concert tickets, but ended up getting ripped off. Nice. So it was basically like wiping his ass with the money. <laughs> yeah. They took a New Year's skiing trip to Lake Tahoe. That's nice. And it's suspected that the brothers attended a Knicks game at some point. Fun it is not row. suspected. It is confirmed, my friend. All right, Kyle, do you want to explain this? Yes. Mark Jackson was uh, playing in a game and had this card come out, and people didn't realize till after the... Uh, murders happened that there was a curious looking fella over there on the left side. Two curious looking fellas. Well, yes. Uh, but that appears to be the Menendez brothers right behind Mark Jackson on the left side there. That's on his <laughs> pl- his playing card. That's so yeah. funny. That's on his like trading card. It's, it's, isn't it's, that insane? Yeah. Let me look up the latest price for this card because I believe it actually went for some money. I've heard that eBay cracked down and wouldn't let people mention the Menendez brothers when selling it. What? Wow. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, one is going for $750, and then there's a bunch of them that are going for like 10 bucks. <laughs> Let's <laughs> so, buy it. Uh, there's a 91. It's a 9.5 rated uh Mark Jackson NBA hoops Knicks card and uh, used seven hundred fifty bucks. Man, and this would have been sometime in nineteen ninety. Yes, I ha- I wonder how many of those are fake though. Like uh, you can duplicate those cards probably. Yeah. So yeah, that's an interesting little tidbit there. The brothers were restless and constantly doing things and buying things, as you can tell. But one thing they did not have was an interest in finding their parents' killers. Yeah. Their friends recall a morbid sense of humor. While deciding what movie to watch one night, Eric suggested Parenthood or the movie Dad. Close pal Glenn (laughs) Stevens asked Lyle how he was doing a couple days after the murders. And Lyle's response was, I've been waiting so long to be in this position that the transition came easy. Yeah, I mean... That's the least of their, uh, you know, guilt, in my opinion. I make jokes about my dead dad all the time. And so you have to have that kind of sense of humor. If, I mean... The gallows <laughs> humor. Yeah, exactly. But a month after? It's, oh, it was only a month? You were telling Geeners about your dad a month after, Kyle? I was telling them at my fucking dad's funeral. <laughs> oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Sounds like a scream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some would say, too soon. Too soon. And Lyle was definitely stepping into his dad's shoes in some ways at this time. He was oh. acting like a big shot. Oof. But I feel like oh, he, you yeah. know what I mean? Like he was Mr. Businessman, Mr. Mover and Shaker doing all these things. I mean, he bought a business for Christ's sake. Well, a, a business. Come on. That was like a, it's a sub shop. But I, I, I think I think the problem these guys are in. Is so you're not going to be investing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> therefore, I am out. Yeah. <laughs> you sell bad uh, ham and cheese sandwiches. So therefore. I am out. Um, no, but I think that these 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 two they're not realizing they don't have fuck you generational wealth money. They no. have fourteen million dollars, which is great, but it's still they're gonna have, you know the 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 real estate taxes in Beverly Hills are gonna eat that up over time. Mm-hmm. They're just they're gonna get screwed. Clearly, the house is not paid off. Probably, and, yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, and it's like yeah, what? they're they're not, they're not gonna be okay unless. They use all that money, pay off the house, make some really smart investment decisions, and just live there. And even with that, you know, you're still not going to, you're going to have to get a career. They don't have the foundation to make the money last. They weren't set up well by their parents. No. Well, I mean, some would argue 14 million is pretty good. No, I mean, (laughs) no, it is. To be, Kyle, to be an adult. They're, oh yeah, they're yeah, stuck yeah. in arrested yeah. development. Yeah, their here. life skills like are life, like, and they're sure. so young. So like, they got a lot of time to, to make some bad decisions. Yeah, <laughs> and that they're about they're doing all of them right now. Yeah, can't fight their way out of a paper bag <laughs> is what my family would say. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what they can't do. Some of their decisions were worse than others. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, arguably, yeah, they had some highs and lows. <laughs> Jose's cousin Carlos found a copy of the 1980 will in a bathroom drawer one day. It stated that everything went to the sons, which was like the other will. And then he later came across a file on the family computer labeled will. 
and he could not access it. Lyle got wind of this and hired a computer expert to try and extract the file, but it couldn't be done. It was corrupted. So Lyle then instructed the guy to erase all the data on the hard drive except that file and then make it look like it hadn't been tampered with. Huh. Why did you just throw it off like the, you know, Pacific Palisades cliff or something to just like destroy it? He basically knew that that might have been the revised will. So when he found out that it couldn't be opened, he was like, okay, cool. Now make it look like you didn't even, you weren't even here. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, if they don't want a real will to be found to like distinguish whether or not they actually were due the money or it was going to go somewhere else. If he hadn't filed it with a lawyer, then yeah, toss it off the fucking Empire Well, State I, I think the problem is that maybe Alejandro's saying this, but there's other people sniffing around this, so they don't want to get caught. You know, that maybe they, they don't want their fingerprints on everything. Yeah. A to family get, to member, get motive. Carlos found the computer. They, uh, they all yeah, know it yeah. exists. They got the family, the family sniffing around, and maybe the... The you know the brother of uh, the the guy who was killed and stuff smells a rat. Yeah, I would have just been like, everything's in the trash. I'm selling the house because w- it's still underwater. We're not going to be able to pay this off. Let's sell the house or just burn it down. Be like, gone. do like whoops, <laughs> the house caught on fire. Well, yeah, the guy from Cohasset tried that and he really? got in trouble. Yeah. Oh yeah, I burned it down the house. He murdered his wife in. After he Googled how to how <laughs> how to dismember a body, how long it takes before a body starts smelling. Yeah. And like his wife went missing. A guy in Cohasset, Massachusetts, his wife yeah. was cheating on him. She was like going mm. back and forth to DC and like for some reason everyone thinks they're gonna get away with it by just burning down the house. Yeah. <laughs> burning down the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> how are we gonna get out of this? Yeah, just turn <laughs> turn on track five of the talking <laughs> heads. <laughs> Yeah, if David Byrne ever did anything like that, he'd yeah. be very suspicious based yeah. on that song. Yeah. He's a co-defendant. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, Coralco Pictures collected $15 million because of a key man life insurance policy with Jose, and they had a great quarter. Wow. Yeah. However, the $5 million beneficiary policy which should have been paid out to the family, was invalid because Jose failed to take the necessary physical exam. Oh, my God. So there was bad blood between the family and the company. And there was also bad blood between director Tommy Lee Wallace and the company. We have a clip here. He directed a movie called Fright Night Part 2, sequel to... Friday Night Part 1? Twins? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it got messed up after Jose's death. Let's see it. Finally, this movie was done, and we were ready to roll. And getting it all set for its big debut, this was on film, and so we were going to have a theatrical release. Herb Jaffe had made a deal with Jose Menendez for distribution and subsequent uh, video distribution and all the rest. The Menendez brothers killed Fright Night Part 2, as well as their parents. Uh, Allegedly. didn't get a release. It it was a very frustrating process that happened after that. It was a one-man operation, and that man was very suddenly, very finally dead. Eric, Lyle, you fucking assholes. That's what I think of you. You killed my movie. Wow. And you must have projections for down the road what you're expecting to make at some point. We think 1989 will be a tremendous year. Wow. Yeah, that fucking guy is out of his mind. He's like, you killed my movie. <laughs> I didn't expect that at the end there. I, I didn't know he was going to take that turn and look <laughs> at the camera. <laughs> Clearly. He just said, you motherfucker. Like, what? That was the biggest tragedy out of this situation. Big time, yeah. Fright Night Part 2. <laughs> In fall 1989, reporter Robert Rand was given the assignment to write about Jose. Not the murders, but how a Cuban-American success story ended in tragedy. In October, he sat down with Eric at the mansion. Eric described his dad as driven, funny, and antisocial. Quote, actually, Kyle, do you want to read this quote? Yes. There were no times for him to get real close friendships, and people became jealous of him. On the weekend, he wouldn't want to socialize. He would always stay home. Instead of going to the movies with my friends, I would just stay home with him. We'd even take showers together. Oh, okay. God. All right. Uh, he got this big bathtub, and Lyle, me, and my dad would just 
We would take showers together. We would do everything together. Woo! So put that in your pocket for later. Stick that in your pipe and choke on it. Suck it. <laughs> the, <laughs> this next chapter is called The Walls Close In. Ooh. On Halloween, which landed on a Tuesday in 1989, Dr. Jerome Ozeal got a frantic phone call from Eric, who said he needed to talk. Although the court-appointed counseling had ended before the murders, Ozeal had contacted the boys and offered his help. He became a kind of surrogate father, offering legal advice, shoulder to cry on, etc. But was there a financial motive, I wonder? (gasps) Because it turns out he charged them $1,300 when he stopped by the house one day to offer his condolences. (laughs) What? (laughs) That's a real uh, Beverly Hills friend for you right there. They charge you $1,300 just for uh, saying hello. I'm sorry, pay me. (laughs) Eric showed (laughs) up at the office on Bedford Drive on the afternoon of October 31st. Dr. Ozeal shared the space with other doctors, including his wife, Laurel, who he had two kids with. Eric insisted they leave and go for a walk, and that's where he came clean. It had been eating him up. Lyle had no idea this was going on. Before this, Eric also allegedly confessed to good friend and co-screenwriter Craig Signorelli in a if-I-did-it kind of manner. After returning to the office, Eric called Lyle and he hurried over. A woman was sitting in the waiting area. Lyle exchanged a few pleasantries with her and then went into Ozeal's private office. So Lyle was furious at Eric's confession. But they talked through it and it got very emotional. Eric came out crying and ran out of the building. Lyle and Dr. Ozeal exchanged some more heated words by the elevator. And at this point, moment, Ozeal's perception was that Lyle was threatening him because he said something like, stay safe, doc. Hey. So does, does Wouldn't the doc- want you to go missing. Does the doctor throw an invoice out the elevator door <laughs> yeah. as they're closing? <laughs> I charge double for threats. Yeah. <laughs> when the boys left, Ozeal phoned his wife and told her to take the kids and stay at a friend's house because he could be in danger. Ooh. Instead of joining them, however, he stayed with his mistress, Judalon Smith, who happened to be that woman who was in the waiting area. She lived in Carthay Circle area of L.A. and operated an audio-video duplicating service and also what? sold crystals and greeting cards. Oh, so business is booming. <laughs> yeah, well, this sounds like a Russian money laundering operation. <laughs> it's a very 1989 business yeah. to have. Yeah. Are you here for the gift cards or do you want a, a tape uh, duplicated? Yeah. Or some want- crystals. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine coming in for both. Yeah. <laughs> Give me another copy of Nick Knight. <laughs> yeah, Johnny's Briss or something. <laughs> Ozeal convinced the brothers to meet him a second time. He informed them that the details they provided him last time were all captured on tape. A semi-truth. They weren't actually recorded. Instead, Ozeal had taped himself describing everything that happened. But he would go on to record all their subsequent meetings. Hmm. Which is illegal in the state of California. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? It is a two-party consent state. Because I may or may not have wanted to record people's conversations with me. Oh, my God. (laughs) Or conversations I was having with other people. And I found out it was illegal, inadmissible. Why are you saying it like that? (laughs) Now I'm like (laughs) afraid to proceed with this now. You should be very (laughs) afraid to be here right now. (laughs) I'm I'm thinking back. What did I say to Kyle? (laughs) (laughs) I'm afraid I have to move on. Yeah. Yeah. The friendship between Eric and Signorelli came to an end in early 1990 when Eric suspected him of talking to the police, which was true. Cops came to his friend and Signorelli offered to wear a wire in an attempt to get Eric to confess on tape. The mission failed. He didn't end up incriminating himself and the recording was useless. Signorelli would go on to soak up the infamy and enjoy the spotlight as a bit player in this saga. Yeah, the problem with being friends with anyone in L.A. when you're younger like that is not only, you know, people just want to get famous any way they can. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Paris Hilton and all those people were like got in like with the sex tapes and stuff. So Mm -hmm. this guy Signorelli is like, I'll take any ticket I can. Clearly the screenwriting's not working out. (laughs) So I'm going to try to do this and set up my friend. Yeah, get famous or get paid. 
Mm-hmm. Look, look at Bonnie Lee Bakley. She mm-hmm. was doing that kind of stuff. Being yeah. like, oh, you wanted to sell the kid for a hundred grand? He's yeah. like, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. She'll star in a movie or she'll blackmail someone. Yeah, yeah. exactly. According to Judalon Smith, on that Halloween afternoon, she stood outside the office door and overheard the confessions and threats. Allegedly, Ozeal also shared details with her in case anything ever happened to him. Months later, as their relationship cooled, Judalon Smith contacted the police herself and told them about the existence of audio tapes where the Menendez brothers are heard confessing to the murders. She but they're useless. She added that the brothers threatened to kill Ozeal if he reported them. <laughs> and she revealed where the shotguns had been purchased. The cops obtained a warrant to search Ozeal's offices and eventually found the tapes in a safety deposit box in a bank on Ventura Boulevard. Wow. It was rare for therapy tapes to be confiscated by police because of a doctor-patient confidentiality. Isn't that HIPAA? But this was considered <laughs> a special circumstance. HIPAA was six years away at this I point. Know, I, yeah. I keep forgetting that you can't. You could easily just take yeah, just tapes take with the medical records. They're mine now. I don't get. It's crazy. The tapes would not be allowed to be used as evidence in the courtroom. Inadmissible. Uh, Judalon Smith would go on to accuse Ozeal of manipulating her and dosing her with lots of drugs as he counseled her. She claims he choked her and led her to believe that her life was constantly in danger from his killer patient brothers. Ozeal denied the accusations. I so th- there's a lot of drama. A lot of weird characters involved. In, <laughs> yeah. Like not real like smart adults. They're just everyone's a clown in this. I think Ozeal was really trying to squeeze money out of them. Oh, yeah. for sure. He wasn't even like squeezing it. He was billing them. No, but I mean even <laughs> even more. I like the invoice, like the, the memo says, like uh, murder, uh, you know, confirmation or something. <laughs> more brazenly, I think he was setting himself up that he could be like, all right, give me a million dollars and I'll never tell. Yeah. This is an invoice for uh, confirmation of murder uh, admission on tape. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Payment upon arrival or and whatever. Yeah. Here's another invoice for uh, deleting the admission of tape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this guy Smith. spells out everything. Yeah. <laughs> Remember she had the tape business, yeah. the duplicates? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. On March 8th, 1990, Lyle was arrested by a team of Beverly Hills cops Uh-oh. as he was leaving the house on Elm Drive in his Eddie, brother's Eddie, Eddie Murphy? Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> his pal Glenn Stevens he was, was stealing the Wrangler? Was in the passenger seat. <laughs> Not the Porsche 911? <laughs> Eric was out of town. In fact, he was out of the country playing in a tennis tournament in Israel. Wow. Accompanied by his private tennis coach. Mm. Eric, oh, yeah, exactly. Eric flew to Miami <laughs> and met with his relatives who lived there. His aunt Marta. Yep. His Hello, aunt, Marta. His, Marta Menendez. <laughs> Hello, Fata. His aunt advised him to fly to LA to face the music. Oof. So Eric face told the menudo. <laughs> the the, the Eurythmics. <laughs> the Eurythmics. The, the Eurythmics. <laughs> So Eric (laughs) called the police and told them he was flying in, and they arrested him at LAX. Wow. Both brothers were held at the L.A. Men's County Jail on suspicion of murder and held without bonds. They must have really wanted him. They they went to go pick him up at LAX. (laughs) Inside the bubble uh, L.A. joke. I think it's a real fucking joke that they're here in this picture. They're both, like, fucking laughing. (laughs) Well... This one's could be. You're not taking She's this smirking. seriously. It's nervous laughter. Maybe. Attorney Leslie Abramson was hired to represent Eric. Abramson had saved a dozen people from death row. Only her client, Ricky Sanders, received the death penalty because oh. he shot and killed four people at a Bob's Big Boy. Oh, Ooh. shit. At the one in Burbank? Yeah, the one up there. <laughs> Not Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'm God. Like, I'm like, they should tell you when you go in there that, <laughs> so, that some people were killed there. They did not disclose. <laughs> yeah, they have to disclose that. <laughs> Every time you come yeah. in, welcome, people were murdered here. Before, Where you're like, smoking a non. Yeah. <laughs> Before you get a tuna melt there, they have to say, by the way, people were murdered where you're sitting. And how do you want your eggs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I asked for a tuna melt. Abramson (laughs) was known for her take-no-prisoners tactics, as the L.A. Times described her. 
and that she spent her working life building a reputation as a four foot eleven, fire eating, mud slinging, nuclear strength pain in the legal butt. And she also, uh, to top it off, she looks like she's cosplaying Barbara Streisand a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. With the hair. Yeah. Very showy. Yeah. Coincidentally, get this, Abramson was at Queens College at the same time as Jose. Really? I thought you you were going to say Seinfeld for a second. He went to Queens College. So they very likely would have been in the same spots, probably. But they didn't know each other? No. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Gerald Chaliff, who also defended the Hillside Strangler, was wow. hired to represent Lyle. Chaliff earlier represented Eric in the burglary case in Calabasas, and he later withdrew due to his personal connection to the family. Attorney Jill Lansing replaced him. Hmm. That brings us to summer 1990. Eric and Lyle were still publicly claiming their innocence, but their lawyers knew the truth. Abramson put them in touch with forensic psychiatrist Dr. William Vickery. In the ensuing months, the boys would finally open up and reveal a long history of abuse in the family. They would also come clean about the murders with their aunts and uncles before they had to hear it from pundits on TV. Oh, wow. So you're saying that the lawyers knew the truth. They knew they actually admitted that they killed their parents to the lawyers? Oh, wow. There are some lawyers who want to know, and there's some lawyers that just say, I already assume that they're guilty, and I don't need to know. There's no way around it with this. Yeah. They already confessed on tape, and there's too much evidence at this point. The cops were already looking at them, and then their behavior. Yeah. But the tapes are bullshit. No, I they know, could but... easily be dismissed in look court. Look at everything else, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way they were acting. For but sure. But I wonder yeah. if their defense was straight up, we just didn't do it if, like, if they would have got off on that. They might have. They were never tested for the bullet residue. Mm-hmm. There's no way to actually prove. There's no, no, no cell evidence. phones tracking you. Mm-hmm. Your every movement It's just like, okay, th- their parents were home. Somebody killed them, and mm-hmm. they may or may not have been there. So they got rid of every piece of forensic evidence. Like, they, they burned mm-hmm. their clothes. There was no blood spatters on them. I may explain that in a little bit. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. Sorry. Ooh. Sorry to get that out of it here. No, I'm just teasing a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Both Eric and Lyle had girlfriends at the time of their arrest. Who <laughs> they were at the old age home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're sitting around waiting for someone to take them to the buffet. <laughs> but she died before the trial started. Yeah. <laughs> they're getting their driving gloves on yeah. and ready to go out. Another victim of the Menendez brothers. <laughs> <laughs> the girls initially supported the brothers before jumping ship. Wow. Yeah, they supported them when <laughs> they thought they could get some money from them. And they're like, oh, they're going to prison forever? Fuck these guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're moving on to some silver foxes at the development here. Yeah. And now we're going to go into the people versus Menendez. Oh, man. Coming up on the next episode. This is one of the most sensational crimes ever to explode in Hollywood. I'm just a normal kid. Oh, Eric, you're a normal kid who killed your parents. Yeah, I know. There's a big, big trial going on here in Beverly Hills. You know about this, the Menendez brothers? I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. The whole country's going court crazy, but is tragic reality really fit material for idle entertainment? Yes. Yes. The murder plot, as twisted as any movie mystery. Was it fear that made them kill, or was it simply greed? These scandalous movies and outrageous books. Menendez, after murder, she wrote Sunday. Enough already. The trial, how the murders went down, and the new evidence that could set them free. Menendez Mania continues next time on Death in Entertainment. <laughs>